Greetings everybody and welcome back to the Air Warfare Group. This is Juice. So today's video is going to be something that's been near and dear to my heart ever since, probably since the early days of my Air Force career. Uh, and that subject is called CSAR training or combat search and rescue training. And uh, this is old school training because we rarely call it CSAR anymore, I guess, in the Air Force. Uh, right around the time that I was getting out, uh, around 2000, the term CSAR was being replaced by personnel recovery, which was a whole different animal. It includes CSAR, but it includes also everything from hostage rescue, um, you know, repatriation of uh, people that are being held against their will. And so before we go into the depth of all this, uh, let's differentiate this. This is how CSAR training used to be for what I pretty much was involved with in a couple of my different facilities uh, or occupations in the Air Force uh, at various places. And I'm going to touch on those today. And so these, this information comes from the uh, about mid-80s to the early 2000s. And uh, we'll talk about CSAR versus uh, uh, personnel recovery later. So, but before I go into this, uh, I need to tell you a little bit about my background so you can tell where I'm coming from. Uh, I started out, my, my military career started out as a Cub Scout. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that haircut is not regulatory. Uh, it's probably a little out of regs and everything. But I kind of built my two, pa two passions that I got from my scouting career from Cub Scout through to Weeblo is I got a, a love for the outdoors and for the wilderness and, uh, and out in the co in countryside. And then I also got my passion to serve, to be part of the community, to do things. You know, we did a lot of cleanup projects. We did a lot of help. Uh, <clears throat> there was lots of merit badges that we had to do to, to, you know, to progress in the scouting world. And it really, I think it was a great thing because it got me in the mood to serve others and stuff. So I had a little period between high school and the military, about two years, that uh, I didn't really do much. I was working restaurant jobs, you know, little small part-time jobs and stuff like that. Uh, but pretty much I was uh, out every weekend partying, uh, sometimes in togas and sometimes uh, without togas. But, uh, you know, I tell people I used to go to uh, undercover parties at togas, a lot, uh, toga parties a lot. And uh, uh, after about two years of wandering around in Michigan, what was I going to do with the rest of my life? I decided, hey, I need to get a job or I need to find something that's really, really moving me forward. And there were no jobs in Michigan at 1982. I mean, it was it was a tough place, and I wasn't ready for college yet. I wasn't ready to get my degree, uh, so I joined the Air Force in 1982. Went to San Antonio, Texas. Went to uh, basic training. Uh, from basic training, I went to my tech school at Chanute Air Force Base, Illinois, where I learned to become a life support specialist, or now they call it aircrew flight equipment specialist. And after the training at Chanute, I had to go to uh, water survival down at Homestead, uh, and I had to go to land survival up at Spokane. And pretty much for the 20 years I was in, about half of that time for those 20 years, about 10 years worth, I worked on various aircraft weapon systems uh, as a survival support guy, working with the aircrew flight equipment, uh, all the things. And we also did the uh, after, after training or the follow-on training or refresher training for uh, pilots on their SEER stuff for their survival evasion resistance and escape. And we always did that with a, uh, with a SEER instructor that was at our base level. Uh, this picture that I just posted here is me inspecting a kit for a base newspaper article at Kunsan Air Base when I worked on F-16s. And then towards the end of my career, I moved all the way up into the, as a master sergeant, I moved up into the physiological support division at the U-2 program where I deployed uh, to the Middle East for various operations and stuff like that. But we'll talk a little, little bit about my more, that a little bit in the, in, in, the, in the briefing. So to give you a timeline, this is uh, stretches from the 70s all the way to the early 2000s uh, before I retired in 2002. So as I said, I started off as a basic life support guy. I went to Okinawa, uh, Kadena Air Base, Japan, which meant that I was never in Okinawa. I was always somewhere else, like here in the Philippines uh, or sometimes in Korea on alert. Uh, as a matter of fact, we would set on alert in Korea because the F-4s weren't as capable as the F-15 as an air superiority fighter, and the Vipers were still being deployed uh, at that time, plus the Vipers didn't have the AMRAMs yet. So we did the F-15 alert uh, from Osan Air Base from Kadena. It was 60-day deployments. We used to go up about two or three times a year, set alert. Uh, and we were up there because of uh, North Korea being ready in case they came across the border. We had uh, K-2 
Kim Il-sung, uh, the great father, uh, who was replaced, as everybody knows, by Kim Jong-il. And then uh, now we have Kim Il, Kim Jong-un, uh, the, the third dictator to be in North Korea. And so after Korea, I got really lucky. Well, I, I actually, had, let me back up. I did a one-year flight test uh position at Kelly Air Force Base in San Antonio where we had six different airplanes, operational test and evaluation, and I was responsible for six different airframes of um, equipment maintenance for the uh, survival equipment. And so by this time I had f eight different aircraft weapon systems under my belt. I had RF-4s and F-15s from Kadena and then these other six that I had at Kelly before Kelly got shut down. So I, I got uh, three years in the service. I went to Fairchild and got on staff at the Air Force Survival School uh, on the wing staff where my job was supporting the instructors with all of the technical sides of, sides of survival, teaching them everything on the signaling uh, flares, the radios, the mirrors, the rafts, the parachutes, everything that was equipment or tech. And a lot of people ask me, what did you do in the Air Force Juice? And I say, well, have you ever seen a James Bond movie? And they go, oh, you were James Bond? I said, no, I was the Q in the basement that worked on all the gadgets and showed James Bond how to use it and stuff. So while I was there, I actually spent about a quarter of my career, five and a half years, here at Fairchild on the wing staff. And while I was there, I got to go out in the field and participate with uh, different exercises involving survival and I actually got to go out and play uh, CSAR support. Sometimes I got to play a pararescue that was going out to make contact and patch up a guy. You know, we would we basically were training students and uh, junior instructors how to follow the CSAR plans and stuff like that. So I got to do a lot of stuff. I got to do a lot of Arctic training up in the high mountains in Washington State. I got to test a lot of survival equipment, some of it that made it into the Air Force inventory, some of it that didn't. Uh, I actually, uh, about halfway through my career at my 10-year mark, I uh, went to a specialized survival instructor course that trained life support guys like myself how to be better life support instructors at the base level teaching the survival continuation training, or we call it SCTB, uh, T S C survival continuation training, uh, SCT. And uh, so my buddy Tom Sinks over on the far left, that's Tom, that's Manny Paz, the life support guy that ran the program there in Dias, Texas. And these are all the people that are in the kneeling in the front row and the, the guys that are in between Manny and, and Tom are all of us uh, life support guys that are getting certified as survival instructors. Uh, and again, we're not SEER instructors like the guys that wear the beret and go to Fairchild. We, were the, we weren't the bug eaters. We were the guys that, hey, sir, you've been through survival school, so every two years you need to go through a refresher course, and we're going to teach that to you. And that's what we did, uh, which was kind of cool because in that, in that capacity uh, as a survival uh, trainer, I got to also play in exercises where I sometimes played the pilot or the the uh, say the survivor as we used to call it. Now they call it the isolated person or persons. And so I got to go out and do multi-day exercises where I got to evade and sleep out in the desert. Um, you know, put wear camouflage makeup and you know basically try to sneak past people that were trying to catch me. Uh, once we get to a certain point, we would you know we call it like the uh, you know we. We'd call it a safe area where we were uh, evading. It was a selected area for evasion, and it was uh, considered to be an area with uh, resources but also low threat. So so I got to do a lot of that, and I became really good at the ground. And then uh, through the exercise uh, environment and the exercise world, I eventually moved up to where I started flying uh, in some of the assigned aircraft that I worked on, like this is me in the KC-135 tanker going along on a couple of missions with the crews so I can see what type of resources that they have in flight, uh, what kind of emergencies they might handle, you know, if they've got a ditch or if they've got a bailout, crash land, uh, you know, and stuff like that. So, so I did tanker support uh, for a few years and on one of those deployments we got to go to Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is at Riyadh uh, International Elf one uh, where we were there for three months uh, in the desert, hot as hell. You don't want to go there. And I tried to avoid it, but I couldn't do it. So between my first desert deployment and my second desert deployment, I was lucky enough to get stationed uh, in Iceland where we had a multi-role mission there. Our mission was air defense and helicopter rescue. And to tell you the truth, my biggest mission there was probably the helicopter rescue, rescue because our F-15 air defense was manned all by, by the time this was 1997 through 99, we were getting ready, 
or we had already moved permanent F-15 forces out of Iceland. So all the TDY or temporary duty forces that came up, they'd come up for two to three months at a time and they would sit alert, fly sorties, and basically be there to p protect the Greenland to UK gap. Where, uh, and, and while I was there, we actually intercepted two Russian bear bombers, which was kind of cool. Uh, but like I said, my main mission was the rescue mission. So uh, I, they found out about my survival background. They found out about my multi-exercise background. So I actually became um, kind of like the base level SEER instructor there as one of my additional duties. I did a lot of local area survival briefs, probably too many to count. Uh, and then I would take out, we would take our pilots out on the refresher training and actually train them with the rescue forces. So we'd take them out and I would be the survival instructor or the training instructor and the survivor escort. I'm the guy there also to make sure I'm coordinating with the helicopter. I know all the procedures on the pickup and everything. And I'm coordinating with the survivor on what's, who's, who's doing this as a refresher uh, to make sure he's safe and make sure he doesn't get, uh, get hurt and stuff. So we did a lot of field training, uh, a lot of tests. I went out and made snow shelters, did all kinds of good stuff. Uh, had to you know build my portfolio of photos for uh, my survival lessons. So uh, I went out and did a lot of fun stuff there. My wife and I were there for two years. Really loved Iceland. I often tell her if I had gone to Iceland single, I'd probably still be there. So the exercises were really fun there because we got live air training. Um, we either got helicoptered out or we'd take a Tundra bus out, go out over on the in the terrain. Uh, as a matter of fact, the area that we're training right now is where the current eruption is in Iceland. So if you look at the Reykjanes Peninsula, which is out by Keflavik, about 25 miles away, is a huge uh, eruption uh, area uh, that's that's pretty much, uh, you know, all inundated, inundated right now with uh, volcanic activity. Uh, if you look at this picture, it looks like the uh, the HA-60G that's touching the ground. It looks like his, his back wheel is tweaked, but it's not. It's just the way the picture looks and everything. Uh, Iceland was pretty fun. Uh, I, I, I liked it, uh, but it was time to move on. It was getting close to my, my uh, 20 years was almost up. I had about three and a half years left. So I finally get stationed in California at Beale Air Force Base where I did uh, U-2 operation support as a physiological support guy. I was actually their training manager. I was responsible for training 120 people, uh, making sure that 120 people received their training and it was documented correctly and all that kind of stuff. Uh, everything from upgrade trainings to retrainings and stuff like that. Uh, and then part of my job there was to deploy with the U-2 program to Saudi Arabia again. Remember I tried to avoid that was unable to do that. So we go back again. Well, lo and behold, the U-2 mission is pretty unique and it's part of the combat search and rescue or was at the time part of the combat search and rescue team. And my boss, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Walt, who you guys met on the uh, Bottle to Throttle episode with Walt Flint, former B-52, U-2, and T-38 pilot. Walt said, Juice, I need you to go to Bahrain and brief the staff the combat search and rescue staff on the YouTube requirements and capabilities. So I did. I went to put on my flight suit, got my patches all shined up, went to buy a bar rain for two, four days, TDY. And TDY again stands for temporary duty. And it was kind of cool because after being like 70 days in Saudi Arabia and you can't drink in Bahrain, you can drink. So I go there and have a couple beers and can't talk straight. <laughs> it's the, actually I, I was talking just fine but you only need two beers after going 70 days and while I was there I got to brief the uh, combined uh, CSAR plan to the uh, for the U2's requirements and capabilities to the uh, Southwest Asia Combat Search and Rescue Planning Committee which at the time was headed up by Lieutenant Colonel Martha McSally now most of you guys might recognize that name that's uh, f uh, former Colonel McSally A-10 pilot uh, who also became a senator in Arizona for a couple of times. Uh, she was our boss there, and so I got to work with her, really po cool person. Uh, I also got to re reconnect with my buddy Brad Casper, who um, who was a SEER instructor that we grew up together with, uh, that we grew up together at Fairchild at the survival school. And uh, because of my background and Brad's background, we started hanging out together, started playing volleyball, but I also helped him transition the theater to the new PRC 112 Bravo which was the Hook 112 radio and it's a it was a, a coded radio that allowed us to do a unique unique identifiers to survivors like if we heard a transmission going off we knew who it was and we also it allowed them to do voice data bursts or voiceless data bursts where they could send information or messages just like the precursor of what a text can do now uh, but a lot more secure and stuff so you guys remember Walt 
my commander over there, this is his 1,000th uh, hour U-2 flight that he did over there while we were deployed there. He's the guy that sent me to uh, Bahrain to represent the U-2 community. Uh, had a lot of faith in me and my CSAR background, uh, and I really appreciate it for that. We keep in touch to this day. We're both retired and in the Pacific Northwest, and we do a lot of backpacking together. If you guys haven't seen it, go back a few episodes. You'll see the uh, Bottle the Throttle with Bolt. It's a really good episode. We're drinking some beers and having an aviation or two. So... Let's get to the meat of this this uh, presentation. Imagine you uh, want to conduct NDCS. You want to do something similar to what we used to do in the 80s and 90s called CSAR training. And I always say, go out and do CSAR training. Don't try to go out and do a CSAR mission right away. Go out and do the training because these guys train 95% of the time for that 1% or 2% time that they go out and actually have to rescue somebody. Um, so you, I, what I like to do is, this is from my map. I like to use Nevada because we have ranges and we can isolate the areas and call them, you know, threat areas and uh, set up walls and ranges so that we don't go into, you know, uh, somebody else's airspace. Uh, and, and what you do is you go out and pick a range uh, out away from Nellis or away from one of the Air Force bases and plop down a survivor, uh, now called an isolated person in the personnel recovery words, but uh, we called them survivors. And uh, the survivor, you put them out there, you can set up a smoke trigger. Uh, that goes on with the F10 menu, or you can set it up for a proximity trigger where the smoke will pop once you get in with certain uh, certain range to the target and everything. And if you want, you can also put a little man down there just so you have somebody to land by if you're going to land out with helicopters. And I mentioned helicopters, so you're going to need a couple of those. Uh, in, in the Air Force, we call them Jolly, Jolly Green. Uh, in DCS, my preferred helicopter right now to do this mission with is the UH-1H the Huey. Uh, one, because you can multi-crew it, you can put in gunners, uh, you can put in a co-pilot to help you out with radios and help, help with navigation and, and communications and stuff like that. Now, because the Jolly guys can't do this all by themselves, you know, they're pretty defenseless when they're, they're low and slow like that, they have to have somebody protecting them, and that's what Sandy does. Sandy, in my day, was the A-10s that would float, and these guys were at medium altitude, they'd be anywhere from 1,000 up to uh, 1,000 up to 7,000 feet. They would be close enough to the ground where they could see any trucks coming in. They were also getting information from the Jollies. They were getting information from the next guys I'm going to show you, the rest kept guys. And these guys are the ones doing a lot of the major uh, com communications. These guys are medium altitude also, and they're usually running between uh, 10,000 and 15 to 20,000 feet. And you might see them as F-16s. You might see them as F-18 Hornets uh, or Rhinos, the uh, the F-15 F-18 Super Hornet. And these guys, the uh, the the rest cap guys, will be up there. There and they're coordinating the they can they, they have the best ability to communicate between all the other players and the assets and see over the horizon whereas jolly they may not be able to talk to the survivor until they're right on them because of terrain masking same for the sandy the sandy might be in a high threat environment might be taking small arms fire and he's ducking and dodging at low altitude so those guys can't get a beat on him with a with a man pad or with a with a triple a and then above that, because the rest cap guys, they need somebody covering their back, you're going to have a fighter cap. And these guys, I call, I call these guys the fighter cap. These guys are the um, F-15s or the F-14s that would go up and do the air dominance role. And, you know, these guys are usually pushing 20 to 40,000 feet, depending on where AWACS assigns them. Uh, I mentioned AWACS, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then our part at the, in the Southwest Asia tour, the, at least my part that I was involved with was the recon part or the ISR, in Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. And in that part, uh, um, you've got assets from drones to the U-2 uh, to national technical means or satellites that are available that help the CSAR players uh, be able to have a little better, better situational awareness on the situation. So... Uh, moving along, you know, oh, I almost forgot bad guys. We need some of those out there. Oh, there's always going to be bad guys. And in your training situation, you can make those AI or you can put some slots in with the uh, combined arms or you can put in air assets like uh, aggressors and put them on the red four so that they show up as hostile on radars and stuff. Uh, I've seen this done with... Um, with actual lot ATC controllers and so it really goes it's really sweet when you get it to come together it is hard to do this mission uh, in DCS because you really have to spend the time to train everybody on their roles and everybody in these different positions right here I granted we don't have anybody doing recon but we can simulate that but everybody that's in these roles right now 
we can uh, we can put people in there and we can train them and the hardest part is keeping them in their bucket or their parameters we need to make sure that they don't go off reservation and get outside of because if Sandy gets too much committed into the uh, the job of Jolly trying to get down low and identify the survivor uh, and find them they may they they're they not only are they're in jeopardy of crashing into Jolly or getting in Jolly's way they're also not in their position to get information f uh, on other threats coming in same for all the other players all the way up the altitude chain. Uh, I mentioned other things like AWACS, J stars, joint stars, and uh, electronic warfare. You know, back in my day, we had EF 111s, and then they were replaced by the uh, EA 6B or growl, uh, the Prowler. And then those are currently being run by the EA, uh, FA-18Gs, Growlers, out of Whidbey Island. Uh, and I've even seen exercises. Uh, we had exercises in Washington State where we had a spooky gunship orbiting, and that was our Spectre gunship, uh, C-130. And that was pretty uh, pretty amazing to see an airplane that could probably rain down a football-sized field of destruction in just a few seconds. Um, and there's a lot more that I don't know about that, uh, or that we don't know about that you might see out there too. Everything from CIA operatives uh, to other things. And and I don't have any information on that. I, my clearance level didn't go that high, uh, and there's probably not a lot of information. But you know the 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 possibilities are limitless, limitless, I should say. So. Personnel recovery is kind of the new word, the new buzz frame. As a matter of fact, it's not new. It's been out for about 20 years now. As a matter of fact, when I was getting out in 2002, personnel recovery was kind of born right around 2000. And what it is is personnel recovery kind of brought the um, – brought the, uh, the rescue world up to the full spectrum where we were able to uh, use this process of CSAR uh, and, and basically recover people uh, like we do in combat, but we can also do it with uh, other hostages, uh, isolated you know, special operations forces, stuff like that. So it, and, and what's really neat about the difference between CSAR and personal recovery is personal recovery is multifaceted. It's not just the Air Force. It's not just Jolly Green and A-10s doing it and stuff like that. So, you know, if you guys want to find more information about this, uh, your uh, your research, uh, you can just Google anything online. Um, I recommend people do that instead of me just giving you all the resources that I have because you're going to find a lot of stuff that I don't have uh, just through doing the search process. So Google is your friend. Go look on it. If you have any questions, you can always put a comment in there, and I'll be able to, I'll be able to uh, respond to that and try to get, lead you in the right direction, I should say. Well, that's all for this briefing, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed my reminiscent uh, history lesson of what I did in the Air Force and how I tied it into DCS to do CSAR training. If you guys like this, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe if you want and share with a friend um, you know keep coming back we we've got a really good channel effort going here we've got a team a team approach to uh, presenting with uh, multiple presenters so it's not just about me and I apologize if this video looks like it was about me today I was just trying to give you guys some information about my background so see how it ties into my being able to speak as a survival and rescue operations guy so that's all I have take care we'll see you in the next video